Well, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, thank you very much for coming. Yes, I'm going to try to convince you uh, that, well, iterators are not quite the, the right thing to do and what we should do instead. So everyone knows iterators. Um, they've been with us since the Stone Age. Um, they're actually originally modeled after pointers, um, so a very low-level concept. Uh, and other people already had the idea that they are bad. Uh, in D, they've been superseded entirely by ranges. The C++ committee, when dealing with ranges, decided that that's not the right direction, and I would agree. Um, so I think it's, it's nice to have something that just designates a single position somewhere in the sequence. Um, they can actually do two things, and, and this is really the core of the talk. Iterators can be elements. So when you have something like this, you have a vector initialized somehow, and you say, okay, give me the minimum element of that vector. Really, what you're talking about is a single element, one in this case, or they can also designate borders between elements. So if you have an upper bound, the upper bound is really the end of the range of zeros. Upper bound back begin back end with a zero is really the end of that range of zeros, and it's right here, that boundary. And the convention is in C++, whenever you have a border, um, you just designate that border with the iterator that's one past the border. And that's the reason why we have this end iterator that's at the very end of the range, uh, but can't be dereferenced. Okay, so iterators can be um, elements and borders. Um, now we have ranges. What's a range? Well, range colloquially is anything that has iterators uh, that can be iterated over. Um, and one part of these things are containers. Uh, containers are your familiar vector lists and sets. Uh, they own their elements. They have deep copying, so when you copy the container, you will copy all the elements. Um, and they have deep constants, so you have a constant container, you can't mutate the elements. It's like, well, that, that's okay, that, that we know all that. Uh, but what else is there? Well, the ranges added the concept of views. What's a view? Uh, well, it's kind of the opposite of a container. It references the elements. Uh, it doesn't own them. It has shallow copying, so you can just copy the view without copying any elements, and they will just point to the same elements as before. And they have shallow constants. So when there is a constant view, this doesn't mean necessarily that you can't mutate the elements. Uh, who is familiar with ranges? Who, who has read the proposals? And, and Okay, only a few of you. Okay. Um, so... What's a very simple view? Well, all these properties here are the properties of iterators. And a very simple view is just a pair of iterators that you pass around everywhere, replace that with a single object, and that's a view. It's a very simple view, the iterator view. Um, and you can use it, as you can see here, it has a begin, has an end. You can use it very much like a container, and that's, that's the, the beauty of it. Uh, why would you want to use it? Well, with iterators, code can get quite uh, robots. So, you, for example, when you have to sort a vector uh, and then erase the duplicate elements, you say, okay, split sort, vec begin, vec end, and then split unique, vec begin, vec end, and then you erase, and then vec end, and there's a lot of repetition in that that you would really like to avoid. With ranges, uh, at least with our library, you can write simply sort in place of the vector and then unique in place, and you solve your problem. That's it. Before I continue, there's a bug in the code. Who finds the bug? <clears throat> Unique and sort. What's the problem? Okay. <laughs> that's, that's one bug, thank you. Now the other one? Okay. Uh, sort uses the less operator to sort. Unique uses the equality operator to remove. If these two are not compatible with each other, then this whole thing won't work, okay? So that's a good argument to have algorithms for that that operate on ranges and not mess around with the iterators, okay? Yet another uh, reason to actually get consistent behavior that you always use the less operator. You sort with the less operator and then you throw the elements away. All right, um, more interesting views. Uh, we have range adapters. So you have this kind of problem. You have a vector. 
you do a find vector of zero, and that gives you the first element with value zero, okay? Nothing new there. Let's do this on a little bit more elaborate vector uh, that has pairs of zero and a character, or number and a character. Uh, and if you want to do then the finding up here uh, on the numbers, on the first, you would write something like this. You find if, and then you have this lambda here, p first equals zero, okay? So far so good. Uh, these two, though, are related in semantics. They actually do similar things. They look for zeros. But the syntax is completely different. That's ugly. You would like to, um, to make, them look look, uh, make them look similar. And the reason why they are so dissimilar is that we lump together the projection and the search criterion. So here, the P first is the projection. You are talking about the first element. And then the equals zero is really your search. And we kind of lumped everything together in a single lambda. Now, how can we do this better? That's the same problem as before. Um, we separate the two. So, and this is where a new view comes in. Um, you first transform the vector and project the pairs of the vector onto the first element. And that gives you a range with 0, 0, 1, 1. We just projected everything ever, uh, onto the first number. And after you did that, you get this object. And the interesting part about the views is when you create this object, nothing happens. You are merely referencing the vector, and you are storing your lambda, and that's it. Only when you start iterating, the, the view will actually start calling the lambda and doing the projection. So you only, it's, it's all lazy, you only pay for what you dereference. And then the find actually looks like the find on any other, on the other range, uh, you just look for zeros. And that, that's now the transformed range is a, a range of, of numbers, so you can look for zeros. Now, there's a little catch. Uh, let's say you do this. You, that's the old find if, what we had before, and you do find if, and then you say second, okay? Well, this gives you an iterator, and the iterator is pointing to the elements. So you can do second, you can do this, and you get the A. When we, do, we try to do this uh, on what we just generated, we first transform and then call the regular find. Well, this doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because the iterator actually will point to ints. This is a, a list of ints. So what you kind of have to do is after you did your find, you have to peel off the transform. And usually libraries provide a function called dot .base, nothing new, already the boost uh, range library, or for example, has a dot .base, uh, and it will just peel off the transform. And what happens here is you first have that list of numbers, and you found this one element, zero, and then you call base. And of course, when you do base, then you want to preserve the identity of your zero. So the zero comes, came from that element, and you want to preserve that identity. So when I give you an iterator to the zero, I want the corresponding element in my range, and that preserving of identity will become important. Okay, here it is again. Want to preserve the identity. Now, let's try the same thing with something that returns a border. Upper bound, for example. You have upper bound, gives you a iterator to the first element, then you call base, and you get this element. Well, if we now talk in terms of borders, we always imply that the border is before the iterator that where we are pointing to, before the element we are pointing to. So the border is right here before the element, and the border is right there. So you can see that the identity of the border also got preserved during this operation. Everything is fine. You see where this is going to. Okay, there's another view, filters. Um, filters just take out elements from a range. So you have, again, our favorite vector, and you now vector, you filter it for all the Bs, okay? So now this one is only the 0B and the 1B. Now we do the same thing. We transform, project onto the first, into the find. Well, the first steps are pretty much what we had before. We have a 0 and we have a 0B, and then you go and have a base of the filter right there. That one, that iterator is coming out of the filter. They must have a base, and it must be identity preserving. So it will just go down to whatever element was in the original range before it got filtered. So far, so clear. Now, it's 
Of course, um, the zero B is not what would you, you would have gotten if you had run the find on some non-filtered version that would have been a zero A, but that's not relevant. Relevant is that we got this thing filtered, we got the number of elements reduced, and the identity of the element when we do the base is preserved. Now we do this on upper bound, okay? So upper bound gives, you, gives us the first, the, the, the iterator of the one, because it will be the, the upper bound of zero is the boundary behind the zero in our filtered sequence. Now we go on, one up, so far so good, right? We, so we took away the transform and we pre preserved the boundary, we preserved the element. Now when we now do base, of course, on the filter, on the filter iterator, we get this element. And here things start to break because the identity of the boundary does not stay preserved. It's ambiguous suddenly where that boundary should be. Um, it's basically when we determined a boundary in this sequence, we did not unambiguously determine a boundary in that original sequence. You could say, well, um, who cares, right? Then don't do this, right? Hmm. It's a filter, you can't preserve identities or boundaries. Deal with it. Okay, we accept that for now. Let's do the same on the reverse adapter. Reverse adapter does a lazy reverse. Um, how does it work here? Well, we do the same thing. We do our transform, and then we do the find. Okay, so we got a zero here, which is the first zero in our sequence. We got, again, an I the element right here, and then we need the corresponding element in the original sequence. This, we can, this sequence is from that way over here, and that one is going from here to there. So we want to find the corresponding element. Base, again, preserves the identity of the element. Go ahead. Um, well, there's no identity, there's nothing, no element in, in, an, in an empty... Well, I, I, don't I don't think I quite follow. So the, um, you mean that when you're, when you're basically having a defined returning an end here? Mm. Uh, okay, but this is not an element. So let me get back to this later on. I think this is wrong in the first place to return end. Find has no business returning end because it is not a, it is, it is not a, end kind of moonlights as two different things. I, I, I'll get back to it, yeah? Um, so, and now of course, here comes the lower bound. It does the zero stitch greater. Well, I had to invent something that actually gives you the same element here, okay? It gives you that iterator. And of course the base and base will again give you this element. Okay, here comes the boundary. You found this boundary before all the zeros. Now this is fine here, but suddenly your boundary should be here. This is the same boundary. And the element you should have gotten back is that one because you, our convention is the boundary lies before the iterator that gets returned. Things start to fly apart. Basically the base has to do has to guess what you mean by your iterator. It can't. It can't do two things at the same time. I, I have a, I, later on, I have a, a basically a more systematic approach or systematic overview of when things break. It's really not that difficult, but let, let me talk about it. It's, it's, you can do it in a, in a, in a systematic way. So, um, Let's talk about the reverse adapter and why it's, why it's breaking. I want to, basically this maybe was a little bit magic. It's like, well, what is this guy talking about? Well, I want to look into like what the, how a reverse iterator or a reverse adapter is usually implemented. And so you understand why these two different, how these two different implementations look like, okay? Um, so how does reverse adapter work? For, first of all, um, you ba store the underlying iterator and incrementing the iterator decrements the underlying iterator. Well, you want to exactly go in the opposite direction. That's not very surprising. Uh, if you decrement the iterator, you want to increment the underlying iterator. That's fine. So uh, begin is end and end is begin. Okay, that's fine as well. But 
the operator star, the, the reference operator, is interesting because you are decrementing the iterator before dereferencing it. Why does that have to be? Well, the iterator at begin stores end, but a begin iterator may be dereferenced and has to return the last element, right? So you have to return base end minus one. So there you can see that base end has to be decremented before you actually de uh, dereference it. Now, the iterator at end, on the other hand, which stores base begin, you, might, you may worry, well, that you're going to subtract one of that base begin. Well, no, you don't, because it's an end iterator. You can't dereference it anyway. And before you dereference it, you actually have to decrement it. And then it's end minus one. And with end minus one, it's then if you do, um, if you decrement the iterator to end minus one, then you can actually dereference it. So, so how, how was it? No, so the, be so the begin um, is going to de get decremented here, and then you direct decrement the end minus begin, and you get returned the last element. So that's, that's okay. You are actually getting, getting the begin. Um, uh, no, I, w I, was, I misspoke. So you are at end. You want to get, you, you can't dereference end. You dereference end minus one, so you decrement your, your end minus one. So the end minus one, by decrementing, you got base begin plus one, and then the begin plus one minus one cancels out, and then you are getting your begin element. Okay. Um, good. Uh, or differently said, the element after the border in reverse sequence is the element before the border in the original sequence. So here is the scope of the problem, the systematic approach of what, what breaks with, with these uh, interpretations of, of borders and, and elements. So if the adapter changes the order of elements, then usually, uh, well, the base of elements is still well-defined, right? You, if, even if this is completely shuffled, you can pick an element and find the corresponding element in the original sequence. It exists. It's only a shuffled version. Now, but borders in general, are, are meaningless. If you have a shuffled version of, of a range, well, a border has, how is a border defined? Well, some elements lie to the left and some lie to the right. Well, if they got completely shuffled, then, then there's nothing to identify that border. And th that, for example, is true if you had a lazy sort. So if you would un do the base and you had a lazy sort um, range, um, then you would be in this situation. The reverse adapter is actually exceptional because everything changes sides. So the base of the border is well-defined in that case, but it's different from the base of the element. Got more cases. Uh, so removal, when an adapter removes elements, then these elements, this is the base element, and the, the adapter removes some elements. That's the problem we had with filter. So the base of element, again, is well-defined. The base of border, is ambiguous, as we've seen with the case of the filter. It applies to the filter. You can also build other situations, board, sorted intersection, sorted difference. Anything that basically removes elements from your sequence has that problem. Now, adding elements. Uh, you, may, you may think, well, so far the elements were always good and the border was always problematic. Well, here is exactly the other way around. So when you are adding elements to a sequence through, a, through a, an adapter, then borders you find in the, in the augmented sequence still apply to the original sequence. That's not a problem. But the, the value may not be in the original sequence, so in that case, or the element may not be in the original sequence, and then the base on the element doesn't work. So base on the border works, base on the element doesn't if you add elements. Uh, sorted union was an example that, that I came up with where you would actually add elements to a, a range. Sorted union is you have two basically two sorted ranges and you kind of merge them together. Okay. Uh, what do we do? We have a problem, right? So just writing base apparently doesn't really work for a wide range of interesting adapters. The adapters that I presented are probably the most interesting range adapters, filter, transform. These are the, by far the most common ones. Um, what do we do? Well, we could say we just have two functions, border base and element base. And you have to decide which one to call. In that case, the call, uh, the, the, call the, uh, the talk would be over, right? We'd be done. Uh, but I think it's very error prone. You have to make sure that you really know what you're doing. Um, and I think we can do better. I think we should separate the concepts. There should be borders and there should be elements. That basically means 
no more iterators in user code. You have to decide in your code, do I have a border or do I have an element? And in that case, base always does the right thing. If that would be the only benefit, maybe you would say, hmm, that's a bit weak, right? But I think we can do, I think it, the code gets better if you do this. First of all, though, we have to find out, can we make this assignment? Can we decide when we look at code, is this a border or is this an element? And what I did as an exercise, I went through our code base and made this decision, uh, at least for the algorithms that we called. Um, is that interpreted as a, an element or is it interpreted as a border in, in the code? And actually, it works quite well. So the returns of find, they had for 200 ones, where 201 calls where we were interested in a single match. We, we actually annotated that we have only a single match in our find. It's not the first one, it's not the last one, it's the only one. 201 matches, um, one had the role of a border, one actually got incremented to get the border after the element. Well, I mean, it's kind of, it's symmetrical, right? One, one time we were interested in the border before and one time in the border after. There's symmetry in this thing that didn't exist in iterators. And the, all the other ones, we're actually interested in the element. Uh, 98 were first match, so there were potentially more matches. Seven had the border role, and five incremented to get the border after, other, others element role. Now, find if, similar situation, uh, 67 single matches, all element role. 75 first matches, three border role, others element. So lower bound. Uh, lower bound is interesting because um, actually it was most of the time we were not interested in the border. Most of the time we actually used the predicate to see whether we actually have a match. We actually did a binary search and we wanted to identify not the, the boundary but the actual element that was matching and we just had a whole ordered sequence. That was, these are these things down here. Okay, so single match or first match. And two were actually were interested in the border role. Upper bound is much more border hole happy, uh, but actually seven got decremented to get the element before. So my conclusion was we can do this. We can do away with iterators and say, you are a border, you are an element. And let's face it, iterators were always ugly. We have begin and an end, and begin is the first element, and end is, uh, as something. And, and why isn't begin like end? Well, I don't know. We never could, ex you have to understand that when you know C++, right? Hmm. Well, that's ugly, right? This is nice. You got elements and you got borders. And you got one more border, then you have elements. All good. It was all symmetric and, and it's, it's nice. What's this? So, you have outer iterator, uh, find, and then you compare it against end. Hmm. So end is this moonlights as no element or the border at the very end. That's strange as well. And we have to mention range twice. There's find range and then here's another range. Why? I want to write this. Right? So if I find this thing, then, then this is it. And, it's, and, the, and the pointer is, is, is null. And an iterator sh or an element should be null, right? Because an element, if it, if it points to nothing, then it's null, not end. End depends on which range you have and why, why is that relevant at that point? So again, border and elements are distinct. So here's the border concept. You have borders. Begin and end are borders. Um, they, they are like iterators, but they can't be dereferenced. You have to make a decision before you dereference them. Do you want the element before or the element after? Now, range and begin, as I said, they are borders. Again, that's not a problem with empty. You can have empty as an empty range. You don't have any elements because range, begin and end, you always have begin and end, but they are borders. Uh, all the iterators going into algorithms, they are always borders because basically when you're going, when you put an iterator into an algorithm, you put them in as a description of a range. So these are borders, begin and end. The output iterators are always borders as well because they're kind of describing 
what's the end? Where am I going to add things? Where am I going to append things to the already existing elements? That's a border. The iterators return from the algorithm. That depends on the algorithm. Uh, these are all borders. So we got mismatch, surge, lower bound, upper bound, equal range, partition point, unique. Uh, here's the description. Um, they, they are all borders. They are not pointing to elements. They're elements. Um, so elements are these in the middle. They are like iterators, but they will never end. And if you are at the last element, you can't plus plus. You can't plus plus into the end. You have a border before and a border after utility, so that converts it into the border before and the border after. And the algorithms that return elements, there are not that many. Uh, min element, max element is the only one I could find. Go ahead. You are not allowed to, undefined behavior. So when you are already at the last element and you plus plus, you, you increment, then you get undefined behavior. It, it depends on your compiler. Um, so, and you can imagine there's an elements of range utility that kind of gives you a range of all the elements where you get past all the elements. Um, if you are, sometimes there are, um, are loops where you actually want to hold on to an iterator. Usually you want to hold on to an element in this case. Um, for example, in, if you implement max min element. So then, I would also make element nullable. Um, that was that, what do you do with a find? Um, they should be compatible with pointers. So the pointers actually satisfy the element concept. You can, you can default construct an iterator, and then you can check the iterator for the Okay, I think I'm going to continue. Um, so you want to make you might want to make the element concept uh, contextually convertible to bool, so you can check it like you check a pointer. And you will reach this null state through value initialization. When you value initialize a pointer, you get a null pointer. Uh, when you value initialize an iterator, you should get or an element. You should actually should get a null element. And then functions returning an element they would return null instead of end. So you can write exactly the auto element find unique, or find. Which brings me to the next thing. Uh, let people encode their intent better. We have a distinction between find unique, find first, find last, which gives you, returns you an element. Um, there is also trim left and trim right, which kind of eats away parts of the sequence, and they return borders. And you basically have to make the call, what do I want? I, you, you are telling a story in your program. And I think you should, be tell, you should tell the reader, am I looking for a, a border or look, am I looking for an element? Um, std lower bound gets used very often to, as, as a tool for binary search. And same thing here. Uh, we have the binary, binary find unique, find first, find last, which all return elements. And these were the, the vast majority of usages of, of lower bound. And then you have the actual lower bound, which, which returns a border. And remember, uh, you're not stuck, right? You can always use border before, border after, or element before, element after to get from one, from the, from, from one thing to the other. So you're not, you're not stuck in the world of, of borders or elements. And I, yes, so we got the unique functions um, to, uh, and, and we, we found this very helpful to actually assert if you're expecting a single match to actually annotate, I'm expecting a single match. And single matches are kind of, kind of useless when you have borders, when you're returning borders. This only makes sense if you're actually returning elements. Um, then you can talk about the uniqueness of an element. So um, we already said you only want to mention the range once, and, and one trick to do that was um, to make the elements nullable. We can do something more. Um, we gave things that are returning borders, certain template parameters, and elements, other return, things returning elements, other template parameters, 
to annotate what you want to be returned. So if you say lower bound you return the border, then you just get the border back. That was the original implementation. But you can also say, hey, give me the take, so from the, the beginning to the border, or from the border to the end. So that's return take, return drop. Um, and if you want the element after element before, uh, we also have that. Same thing for elements. So there you have a whole zoo of things that you can actually specify. You can say, okay, I want an element or null. Um, or I can say, you know, I, I'm really expecting the element to be found. I want to assert that there is no null return. So you got the return element. And again, there is re re the return border before and after, which you can then combine. Well, what, what do you do if you don't find an element? Either I'm expecting to always find an element, or I'm just going to re um, return you the whole thing or nothing, or the whole range or nothing, begin, end. So um, here, same similar situation. So you you can take take before, take after. That becomes basically the borders combined with returning a particular range. So you begin to before the element, begin to after the element, and the same with end. Here's uh, how this is implemented. Uh, really simple, right? So you are. Um, your um, algorithms actually call these pack element, pack no element functions, and they actually ret generate the actual return value. Pretty, pretty easy. Okay, that was it. Um, the iterator originally was modeled after pointers. It's a very low-level concept, and I don't think it has good semantics. Element and border have much better semantics, and you can express your intent much better. Uh, and they are actually indeed needed for the correctness of, of base. Um, we have parts of that uh, implemented in our range library. Uh, the element is nullable. We have the algorithm refinements, return specification. Um, we still don't have this implicit conver uh, the, the, the explicit conversion between element and border. And we also don't um, keep borders from being dereferenced. So um, th there's still work to do, uh, but that's definitely the, the direction we want to go into. Thank you very much for listening, and uh, well, we are here for a reason, so applications are always welcome. Thank you very much. No questions? Um, thank, thank you for your talk, it's very interesting, uh, and maybe less controversial than I expected. Um, so obviously a lot of people are doing a lot of work on uh, standardizing improvements to ranges. Do you think that you would like to see the concepts of elements and borders introduced into the C++ standard? And have you guys talked to people like Eric Niebler who are working on that sort of area? Um, I, I, think, I think the answer is yes, we would like to, uh, but I have been to standard committee meetings. Um, other people in our company have been to standard committee meetings, not with this topic, but in general. And it's a very large and politicized group. And currently, we don't have the resources. Uh, I, I think that would need someone dedicated to, to C++ standard committee work uh, to get this into the standard committee. Um, if any one of you is interested uh, in doing this kind of work, sure, uh, come talk to me. And um, it's it's... I think it is a very it's a very challenging job because at the same time you people who are very qualified uh, in programming C++ uh, they they usually do very productive things and they are not very inclined to spend time with politics uh, but that that's exactly what you need to do when you go to the standard uh, committee meeting so that's um, uh, yeah it, it would be nice I think and I think it's going in the right direction I I, th I believe in it. I think that's so far so clear, uh, but um, yeah, so it, it, it would be nice. Mm. Uh, can ranges exist without this? Uh, yes, probably yeah, they can. Uh, hi, so I just, um, so the world's full of iterators. I'm just wondering how um, sort of elements and borders sort of play with iterators in the same uh, sort of code base or library? If you've got any experience of moving from one to the other, is there a transition or is it 
all or nothing? Well, I mean, um, all that that um, that stuff is 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 all basically sugar, right? So you can always uh, say um, borders as well as elements um, 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 decay to to iterators as at any time if you like. Um, so it's really just a specialization of 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 iterators. So I think it would not be a problem to have a, a mixed zoo of things. Um, so you could always call a function and and it returns an element. And if you then keep using it as an iterator and you assign it to an iterator type, uh, that's fine. Um, if you uh, if you do things like lots of auto, uh, maybe you uh, you would run into problems because things you, you know the types will percolate through your system. But yeah. Hi. Um, a lot of the time, when you're dealing with a range of elements, you need to perform a series of operations but you don't want to perform it on the first one or you don't want to perform it on the last. A bit like you want to print a list of numbers and have a comma in between each one. You don't want a comma after the last one. How do you do that with ranges? Um, I think this is probably something that's not very, um, that's probably not a question that's, that's particularly related to, um, to borders or elements, uh, but it's an interesting question. Um, There, there are certainly cases where you you kind of have to distinguish the cases where you can efficiently omit one of the elements. Then it's okay. So you can basically have a you can then have a for each pair, for example. That's I think one of the prototypical situations that you are talking about. I would like to would be uh, every pair to be returned. Um, it's. We have a for each pair implementation that runs on iterators. The tricky part is that you have to keep the iterators alive. Currently, the the the, uh, the lib no the the standard requires that a reference to an element inside a range will only live as long as the iterator lives. So you have to keep the iterator alive to make a standard compliant implementation. Um, and the the thing is that the reference can reference into the iterator. So the iterator can't even move. So the way we are doing it, it's not, f it's, it's, it's overhead, uh, is that you basically keep memory two places in memory around and you have to kind of use them alternatingly um, and, and replace the iterator and the corresponding reference. And it's clumsy, yes, uh, but it, absolutely, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, and maybe the requirement that you have to keep the iterator around is just a bit too, a bit too much. So maybe uh, it would be okay to say um, either you are returning a reference and then this reference has to be, I, I, I saw you, um, I, this reference has to be, uh, has to be in the container uh, or the, you have to return a value from the iterator and then the iterator can die. Right now, the, the, the real problem is when the iterator contains the value and the reference is, is referencing into the iterator. The only very common case where this breaks that I know of is the counting iterator. So the counting iterator is really problematic because the very natural way to, to actually do this is to have the iterator just be the thing that's counting, just the int, and it just counts up when you say plus plus. And when you do reference it, it's, it's a wrapper around an int. And when you do reference it, you return that iterator, uh, or return the, this inner thing that's getting incremented. That's fine if it's an int, you can return it by value. But if, it, if it's becoming something bigger um, and you still want to increment it, then it's becoming... Yeah, it's becoming problematic. Um, th that's something that I encountered throughout designing this range library, that very frequently you have situations where you have gray zones of best performance, where it's usually the, the simple things are clear how to implement them, but on the fringes, it, it becomes kind of fuzzy and, and things become complicated. I, I think there was another question in the very back. Um, it's just a response really to the question which has just been asked. So this has actually been um, added to um, Library Fundamentals Technical Specification 2 as a sort of experimental O-stream joiner. There's an implementation for it in 
um, libstud C++. I can't find one for libc++, so maybe a gentleman would like to contribute an implementation. It says there are still missing borders, not the referenceable non-implicit conversion element to border. But my understanding of this talk is that the whole purpose of borders and elements is to separate the two concepts. And so it sounds like here that it's a shortcoming, but isn't that a feature? Otherwise, you're in the old iterator concept. Uh, really. I, I, I didn't quite catch it. So I well, borders are not dereferenceable. That's a feature, right? That is the whole purpose of yes. borders. Yes, yes, absolutely. But yes, we yeah, it looks we do like it. it's still missing, as if that's yes, a shortcoming. Yes, because we haven't wrapped every iterator that we have in the program. We should wrap them all, and we should disable the 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 uh, the um, we should disable the the dereference operator. Um, it's a ah. it's a bit. You're very, you're very much, in, in this case, you're very much inclined to do this type punning trick where you derive of, of a value or of the iterator. You just cast it up and, and uh, to just disable, uh, disable the, the method. Um, yes, I would like to do that, uh, but I haven't yet. Um, yes, it's a feature, certainly. This is directly piggybacking off of that, but with the comment earlier someone over there made about if there's going to be compatibility between the old iterator interface and the element border interface. Uh, if you do separate those concepts completely, you have to like let go of backwards compatibility because there'll be code that tries to dereference uh, an iterator that actually represents a border, right? Right, well, so you... You can't have something that satisfies both concepts. Well, you could say um, I have an iterator, and an, an iter an a every border and every element has a has an, an a, a body iterator that allows all these things, and and yes, of course, then you would break your abstraction certainly, uh, but it would at least be a way out. So you could say every my uh, my algorithms are returning borders and elements, uh, and then at, at some point where I didn't want to change the code, I just say uh, dot iterator or something like that, and I convert it into an iterator where suddenly I'm free to do anything that you want. Um, so and and you would have to kind of eat away at these at these places and kind of remove them throughout your code, and when you're done with all that, then then you're done. So you presented this quite a few times, and I think your reasoning is sound, and I agree with what you're saying. I want to know if there is, has been any interesting criticism or any major drawback about this kind of reasoning compared to iterators or alternative models. Okay, it, it would be, it, it sounds a bit stupid, but no. <laughs> So I gave a talk. I gave a talk at, at uh, meeting C++, and that's where where I, get, I. That's the only time I gave that talk, and presumably the, the audience was. We had a full room, and and uh, the audience was knowledgeable, and uh, we we kind of people liked it, and and we used it in our code base, and and it as far as we implemented it, it it works, and it's it's fine. It clears things up. Um, so I don't, yeah, I think. Hmm. I told you, I, d d I don't want to use iterators anymore. I want these. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. How would your model work with input iterators? For example, I'm reading a stream. Currently, I only know that I'm at the end after I try to advance past the last thing I read. I'm not, I I'm not even sure that, that input iterators are really iterators. They are, I mean, you, you can ask for the next value, and that's pretty much all you can do with them, right? Um, so are they, I, I, do we really want to put them into that, into that, that, that group of, of things? Um, what, we, what we do have are, uh, and that's, that's now range li our range library, and, and, the, and, the, and there, there's a connection to input iterators. So if you weaken input iterators even more, you can get something like generators. Basically, a function that just spits out, that calls a callback for every, um, every element that you get, okay? And th the, the good thing, um, it, the many of the algorithms that you have currently on ranges, you can actually implement on these generators. 
uh, any of, all of, for each, accumulate, uh, many of the things that you usually do. So many of the things, many of the ranges we use in the code are not even iterator-based ranges anymore, but are just generators. Um, so, and, and an input iterator is a bit stronger because you, 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 you invert the iteration. You call it to get the next element. But I'm, I don't think there's any meaningful thing about multiple elements because you only have one. You can't even copy them and get the elements several times. So I'm not, even, I'm not sure this is even the right abstraction. I think it was like, okay, all we have is iterators, everything. If all we have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail kind of case, I believe. Borders, <laughs> by introducing elements and borders, don't we break the interoperability bit uh, with the, the input iterators? So, so we, if we have suddenly uh, two secret uh, families, let's say, and of what was used to be one family. The, the, the I mean, ranges don't have any good representation for input iterators. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that that all the support for for input iterators is so in the range library is already going to go away in in a, in, a, in a way so i am not sure how many input iterators we have in the program not very many uh so in terms of this issue of uh whether these can interact happily with iterators it seems to me that it would be, it would be more potentially be more difficult to have this issue of everything suddenly starts returning borders and elements and then they decay to iterators. So I don't know. Maybe you're right, and that can completely work smoothly. But that seems more uh, controversial, let's say. But it seems like a lot of the places where you highlighted there being real issues are where you've got things like views and adapters, which aren't as yet in the standard. So could it? <coughs> excuse me. Could it possibly work that when like views or adapters get added into the standard, those return elements and borders, and the existing algorithms like sort and what have you uh, use concepts to detect whether what you've passed them, I mean, obviously, if you pass them a range, there's nothing we could do about that, but if you pass them something that's a border or an element, then it will do the smart thing. I think. Uh, and, and return border and element, or if you've got views or adapters that do borders and elements, otherwise it will always default to doing iterators. Is that a sensible compromise? Th I, think that's, I think that's probably reasonable. I, I think what you're basically saying is leave the STL alone, yeah. the standard library, right. let it return iterators, and when we are doing the move to standard, uh, the, to algorithms that are, that are supporting ranges, at that point uh, we could make the move and say, okay, they can uh, actually return something. No, uh, not ranges, because uh, as I understand it, the ranges TS is pretty much. Um, well, okay, but is currently we don't have any. Uh, or the some of the algorithms we are. I, I think some of the algorithms we already have. So there, you would have to do something in order to decide what what kind of algorithm are you calling? Do you want an iterator? Or do you want this element, um, uh, this uh, this element border world? To be honest, I haven't. Th we we have been doing this in our in our sandbox. So I've I've not entertained a, a, a standard proposal for it. And uh, I think it would be very difficult because, I mean, a lot of people would be have very large concerns about backward compatibility. Um, so far, we've been using this in our, in our own code and, uh, and, and we liked it, it, it works consistently. Uh, and, and there, of course, we can change things at will. Um, so I, I, I think that would be an overstatement to say I know exactly what the path is in order to get this into the standard library. Given that um, you're not proposing we change anything to do with iterators and that we're going to keep ranges on, <coughs> would it make sense to just adopt ranges as taking the role of your elements concept? Of course, it's more than your elements concept. Do you ever have elements just on their own and then just introduce borders as just the one additional concept then? Which is usually the only time you will actually have a single iterator rather than a pair. So you're basically saying make an element in, in a range of size one. Is that? Uh, if you need a single element, you'll be a range of size one, yes. But rather than having a, an element concept, just have, we've got iterators anyway, just have ranges and borders. And then there's less new things to introduce. Now, obviously, mm. ranges themselves would effectively be 
uh, an element and a border. But uh, that, but you could I'm a bit afraid you're going to end up. I'm a bit afraid you're going to end up in the D world, because where everything is arranged. So you, that basically would mean if you if you, I'm uh, if I'm running if I'm running find, then I'm either getting an empty range back or a range with one element which contains the element that I'm uh, that I'm looking for. Um, is that bad? W well, I, I don't I don't know. Um, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not maybe. I think it may be relevant in practice whether you have a, you know, if that you know that you have only a single element. We we found that 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 this um, supplying more algorithms just to get the right asserts in helps tremendously. So this find unique, for example, um, in in the same way, maybe you want to know whether w the thing that you have in your hand is a one-elemented range or an a a a, a general range, uh, and and if you make a separate basically compile time thing that can tell you I'm a single element range, well, then indeed a single element range would be in no way different from an element, um, if, if that's at compile time available. But if you don't have it at compile time, then I'm, I think you're losing, you're, you're losing compile time safety that you could have had uh, if you knew or if, if you had annotated things as I, I know that you are only one element. So. I was thinking Phil's comment made me realize you could define borders as just algorithms, algorithms returning pairs of ranges. And then you have elements on the left and elements on the right. And the border is basically when the ranges meet. Have you thought about that? Right, and, the, and all this is, um, can be done. And I think this is exactly what D is doing. So the I, I, I th maybe they maybe they return only the first range and you have to subtract the the the, the first range from the second range or or so to to get the to get the other part. But this was exactly the idea. So you everything is a range. I think that's the D idea, um, and and I found it a bit clumsy. Um, can it be done? Well, certainly, D exists, and, and D has a library, and, and, and they, they found consistent semantics for everything, so yeah, it can be done. Um, I, I'm, I, I think it's nice if you, or it's, it's, it's less artificial. I mean, if you want to divide up your, your, your range into, into three things or five things, that you then have, well, if you have five things, then these five things have six borders, so you return six borders. So it's uh, you have redundancy in your representation if you say, okay, I'm going to return you two ranges because then you, where's the assert that tells you that the end of the last range is the beginning of the first uh, or the, the end of the first range is the beginning of the second range? Um, it, you would like to have that assert, and that was that, that's what we really try to do: get all the asserts into the as many uh, ways to express your intent as possible that you can actually check for and that it, that are actually checked either at compile time or at runtime with with asserts that you don't have to write. I think there were one or two more questions, but it's, uh, it's just gone nine o'clock, so we probably need to finish there. We could probably have some more questions afterwards. But um, can we uh, not only thank Arno for his talk, but also thank Sal for providing the, the pieces and beer tonight? And uh, Arno did mention it briefly at the end, but the, the, the whole reason that um, they're actually sponsoring tonight is because th they are hiring, they are trying to raise awareness for their organization. Uh, and let's see what, what sort of cool place it is to work at. So if you are interested, then uh, do uh, speak to them directly or, or come to me if you, if you can't find them. Um, that, that's the whole reason they're sponsoring. Uh, unfortunately, no, it's only Berlin. But we are still coming. You're still hoping. <laughs> uh, was there anything else you wanted to say about ThinkSell before we finish up? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so um, what we are doing is um, it's so th the boring part is it's an add-on for PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> the the more interesting part is um, that we want to do automatic slide layout. So the idea is um, that you. You, you don't place your elements on the slide where they should go, 
uh, but rather you only define the relative relationships. You say, okay, I want a box on the left and the box on the right, and you put the content in, and uh, at any time you can actually change the slide around by adding more content or, or, or taking columns out or, or adding them, and uh, we actually calculate a new layout. And th this is interesting in, as in the UI sense. It's very tricky to get a very good UI in there. Uh, and it's interesting in the optimization sense. So I the optimizing for good looking layouts is, is very tricky. Um, so that, that's kind of the, the very interesting thing we do. Um, and, and eventually then afterwards we also want to replace Excel, but that, that's a different story. So. Well, thank you again, uh, Arno and uh, Jonathan for speaking tonight. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> I don't know if there's still anything left on, on the tab behind the bar, um, but if not, uh, we usually go to um, uh, Beer Shanko around the corner to, to continue if you, if you want more beer. So we'll see you there or we'll see you next month. Thank you. <laughs>